So the story kind of begins with the WHO, the World Health Organization. And the WHO actually works with a few of the regional labs. So there are actually five labs sprinkled around the world. And these labs collect specimens from hundreds of countries. So hundreds and hundreds of countries do surveillance to figure out what type of flu is affecting their particular population. And they will send this information over to these five regional labs. And I'm just going to quickly draw out for you where the regional labs are. There's one over here in the US. There's also one down here in China. And then there's another one over here in Japan. And a fourth one in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia. And finally, there's one in the United Kingdom. So this is the, the last one. There are five in total. The WHO will take a look at all the different strains that have come into these five labs, again, from all over the world. And they'll try to make a decision as to what makes the most sense because flu usually kind of moves around the world in a very predictable way. So they can make an educated guess as to what strains they should include in the vaccine to protect people most effectively. Sometimes they'll use a strain that they used in previous years and sometimes they'll pick something brand new. So let's go through the three strains that they actually picked for the most recent vaccine, the 2012 2013 vaccine. I'll start with the type of virus they put in there. And generally, it's two type A's and one type B. That's the, the usual kind of formula that they use. The WHO recommends that for the trivalent or three strain vaccine. And the exact one that they choose can be actually followed. They usually name it uh, in part based on location. So they'll say, okay, the type is A. And they'll say the location is in this case the first one actually came from California the second one came from Victoria Australia and the final one came from Wisconsin in the United States so this is the location of the three strains in fact if you ever see it named you'll see a slash between these two so I'll put a slash here as well next they actually have strain numbers so they'll give you a number and what that number uh, refers to it doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot to us but we're going to put it in there just because that's how they name things. The strain number is, for the first one, 7. This is 361. And this is strain 1. And then finally, they'll put the year that they actually identified this thing. So the year of identification. And this first one, this type A, was actually identified back in 2009. Whereas the other ones are a little bit newer, identified in 2011 and 2010. So that's what comes after the strain number. And finally, the last thing, uh, which only applies to the first two, is that if it's a type A, they'll actually tell you the H and N type. So for example, the first one, the California strain, this one is actually a type H1N1. And the second one is an H3N2. And the third one, because it's a type B, we don't you really use that H and N classification, so I'll just put uh, kind of a, a hash there, meaning nothing. So if you ever come across these things in some sort of formal document, at least now you know what the heck all these numbers and words refer to. So this is literally how they kind of name the strains. And just for you and I to know, this first one here, this one is actually an old strain. So this is actually part of uh, the last few vaccines. This is not a new one that was included. Whereas these other ones down here, these ones are actually new strains. They were not part of the vaccine in previous years. These are new additions or changes to the vaccine. So just to kind of remember, we always include two type A's and one type B. And the type A's, one is a H1N1 and the other is an H3N2. That's how we've been doing it in recent years. Now let me bring up a little bit more canvas because I want to talk you through exactly what happens once the WHO decides that these are the strains they're going to use. And this decision was actually made back in February of 2012. So months and months in advance, they're figuring out what strain we're going to use. And that information then goes to the next group of folks, which is the manufacturers, right? The manufacturers are going to take this information and they're literally going to start putting things together. They're going to start the manufacturing process. And one of the key parts of this process, which a lot of people don't realize, and it's pretty mind-boggling, is that you need millions, actually hundreds of millions of eggs. Uh, the same kind of eggs you might eat uh, for breakfast, but these eggs are actually laboratory grade, and they're needed for making this process work. And once it's made, one of the key things, and this 
reassures a lot of folks is safety. We want to make sure that these things are safe. And so a lot of testing goes into making sure that all of these vaccines that they, that they make are safe. So once that's done and people feel comfortable that it's a safe vaccine, we start distributing it. So distribution is next. And we're going to go through each of these stages and think just a little bit about kind of which people are involved in all these steps. But I just want to kind of lay out all the steps first so you get an appreciation for how many players there are and how many steps there are in getting a vaccine to you. So it goes, of course, from distribution, it goes to these clinics, and then finally, at the end of the day, there is uh, a person. There might be you. And so this is you getting your flu shot, and you're very happy because you're now protected from the vaccine. And I'll draw a little bit of a, uh, a little shield around you, a little protection for you, to make sure that, uh, that it's clear that you're protected not completely, I'll draw a little hole in the protection, not completely because the vaccine isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. And in fact, this year, in terms of how well the vaccine is working, not in studies, but in the real world, in terms of how it's doing uh, as people are getting it, about 62% effectiveness. So it's actually really quite good. In studies, we always kind of see around 60 to 70%. And now in real life, we're seeing a 62% effectiveness in terms of vaccine effectiveness. The word effectiveness just means kind of real world data versus efficacy is kind of what we see in studies. That's the, the difference in the two words. So let me list out some of the different folks involved at each step of the way. So in terms of selecting the strain, we said that the WHO is responsible uh, in working with all the different countries and the public health groups and laboratories and scientists that are kind of looking at all the strain data. And then in terms of manufacturing, there you got to think about the vaccine industry, right? There are many, many big players here. Uh, big business is involved in terms of churning out millions of doses of vaccine. So here, the vaccine industry is a, a major player. And then you think of all the other groups that are involved. So I said that you have to get uh, hundreds of millions of eggs to, to make this process work. And so, of course, then you have to really work with farmers, right? And if you have a year where the flu is really hurting the birds and the, the chicken population, then that's going to make it really hard because there are fewer eggs to contribute to the vaccine manufacturing. So it's actually kind of an interesting thought process. You know, flu obviously affects chickens as well as humans. And so if those populations start dying out, then even humans suffer because we don't have the vaccine. Now then safety is huge, right? So you have to think of all the different countries that that have organizations that care about safety. And in the US, the one that comes to mind is the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. So each country has its own kind of uh, process of thinking about safety. And those groups are obviously very involved in making the vaccine as well. And then you've got all these logistic things to think about. I mean, if you're making hundreds of millions of vaccines, you've got to distribute them around the world, right? You've got to think about airplanes that can actually take your flu vaccine and move it around. You've got to think about refrigeration, uh, maybe uh, ships, right? If you're moving across large bodies of water, uh, maybe trucks to get vaccine inland if it's cheaper that way. So lots of logistical issues to kind of think about how to get vaccine distributed. And then finally, you've got nurses and doctors in the clinics that have to be informed. They need to know when to start making appointments for their patients and how to set up clinics to kind of actually administer the vaccine to all the folks. And finally, we've got you, right? You're at the end of this chain. And not just you, but there are about 250 million folks just like you getting vaccines. So 250 million doses are actually put together. And this is quite an effort, right? You can see the, the countries involved, you know, and getting all that information to all these different groups that have to get involved in terms of making this even possible. So to me, this is actually one of the most impressive feats out there. And it really is a testament to what science can do for mankind.